Hello, and this will be a short video in which I introduce some arguments from George Berkeley's Three Dialogues Between Hylas and Philanus. I'll just uh, take a few seconds to organize my screen and hope that it maximizes clarity. Um, ultimately conceptual clarity, but um, start with the clarity of the words. Let's look at the arguments in Berkeley's three dialogues between Hylas and Philanus. The first dialogue has this for its main argument. Now, I think we could switch the word immediately for the word directly, and maybe that will be clearer. I think we might try that. Uh, the first premise of this argument is whatever we perceive, we perceive directly. Also, whatever we perceive is a quality. And also, as it turns out, all qualities we perceive directly are in the mind. What follows from that, everything we perceive is in the mind. Now, these are the sub-arguments that are given for that third premise. Any quality which we perceive directly is in the mind. How do you know that? Well, because some qualities are identical to pleasures and pains. Pleasure and pain can exist only in a mind. So these qualities exist only in the mind. Oh, so for example, um, uh, if, I, if I poured some scalding hot tea into this teacup and got careless and spilled, well, let me rephrase. If I poured some scalding hot water into this teacup to make tea and got careless and spilled some of the scalding hot water onto my own arm, the perception of the heat and the, the perception of the heat and the, the pain of being burned by the scalding water would be the same sensation. And therefore, the heat I'm perceiving is purely in my mind. The perception by which I perceive it is identical to pain. And the pain is purely a mental thing. Uh, Non-mental things don't experience pain. Only minds experience pain. Next, the qualities we perceive differ from perceiver to perceiver. As... Um, as I'm seeing red, and um, who knows what the cameras might might do to to change the irrelevant light wavelengths from from uh, from from this folder to to the camera or from uh, your your computer screen to your eyes. But uh, if we were in the same room, no cameras, no videos involved, no nothing at all except the air between the eyes and the red folder. If we were in the same room, looking at the same red folder. I would see a particular shade of red. Maybe you'd see a slightly different shade of red. If you're colorblind, you might not see red at all. You might see some version of gray or something. So what does that mean? Well, the qualities that we perceive differ from perceiver to perceiver. But every quality that is different between one mind and another mind must actually exist only in the mind. Therefore, the qualities we perceive exist only in the mind. So all this leads us to this conclusion. All objects of perception are in the mind. That's that's um, George Berkeley's first dialogue between Hylas and Philonus. Now, in the second dialogue, Hylas, who begins as a materialist and then in the middle of the dialogue becomes a skeptic, gives us this argument: all objects of perception are in the mind. Now, note that we are um, we are recycling this. This is the the conclusion of the first dialogue, and it becomes a premise in. Uh, later passages of the text. Uh, in, in logic class terminology, it's a sub-conclusion. It is a conclusion with respect to certain premises, but it is used as a premise for some later conclusion further on in the analysis. Okay, so all objects of perception are in the mind. We'll use it again here also in the second dialogue where Philonus uh, enlightens Hylas and helps him to escape his um, uh, his materialism. I mean, perhaps using the word materialism use loosely. Usually it means the theory that uh, that all is matter. Here, actually, uh, it might be better to say not materialism, um, but some other word, because Hylas thinks matter exists. And uh, that's the problem. He needs to be enlightened and give up his uh, false opinion that matter actually exists. Okay, anyway, Hylas. Hylas, second dialogue. All objects of perception are in the mind. But whatever is real exists outside the mind, so whatever we perceive is not real. So Hylas is very uh, upset about um, his view that w 
what exists, uh, what is real exists outside the mind, which leads him to uh, despair. Uh, and skepticism, whatever we perceive, is not really real. Uh, at this point, he's already actually given up his uh, view that matter exists. Hylas has learned from Philanus in the first dialogue that um, any matter we perceive must be only in the mind. Therefore, he concludes, rather upset about it too, whatever we perceive is not real, but Philanus enlightens him and does a better job. All objects of perception are in the mind, he argues, and therefore, since whatever is real exists independently of the human mind, and since what we perceive actually is real, this is uh, not required as a conclusion. This may be used as a premise. Objects of perception are real. Uh, despite the fact that Barclay is the guy who denies that matter exists, uh, he considers himself a very common sense person. He's trying to preserve common sense. Objects of perception are real. What we perceive is real. The teacup is real. I perceive the teacup. It's real. That's good enough. Uh, he is uh, an empiricist who takes our experience and our perception very seriously. So, um, he thinks of himself as a common sense philosopher of sorts. Objects of perception are real, and what we perceive is in the mind, and what is real exists not uh, outside the mind, as Hylas would say, but independently of the human mind, in the human mind, but independently of the human mind, and accordingly, there must be a God. God, the divine mind that perceives all things, must exist. Now here's another argument. Second dialogue still. Again, all objects of perception are in the mind. Matter, as Hylas understands it, is something that exists outside the mind. And we have no perception of matter because all objects of perception are in the mind. But matter is not there. And if we have no perception of matter, then it turns out matter does not exist. You have a couple of the premises to help get you there. Well, actually, a, a premise and a sub-conclusion, if you want to be technical. Uh, we have no perception of matter. God is a sufficient explanation for the reality of our perceptions, so there's no, re no need to reason to the existence of matter. We have no perception of matter, no, no argument that matter exists, like we have an argument that God exists. There's no need for matter to explain anything. Nothing that needs to be explained can be explained by saying something called matter exists. What needs to be explained is explained by the existence of God. There's no need to reason to the existence of matter, and we certainly don't perceive it, so Occam's razor just cuts it off. There is no matter. Uh, that is the conclusion of Philanus in the second dialogue. And now, what about the third dialogue? You'll note I don't have notes here for the third dialogue. Well, the arguments are different. They're not the main arguments for immaterialism. Rather, the structure of the book is more like this. I've just pulled up some other notes. Uh, actually, let me um, fidget with my uh, computer screen. Okay, so this is, uh, well, it's in the middle of a section on Barclay in some of my other notes. And here is what happens in the second dialogue. Philanus proves God exists. Hylas, who started off presuming that common sense requires us to acknowledge the existence of mind-independent matter. Hylas has been enlightened. He gives up uh, belief in matter. He says there is no matter. And in the third dialogue, he gives up his skepticism, he adopts materialism. And Philanus describes some advantages of his views, his view of immaterialism, the view that matter does not exist. So this is, uh, this is um, finishing, finishing the job. I, I'm not a huge fan of just giving you some arguments from Barclay and leaving it at that. No, uh, these arguments are in context. They're in, they're in this book. Um, the, the, the major goal here, uh, as far as I'm concerned, is to first understand Barclay. Uh, once we understand Parkley properly, by all means, uh, we can proceed to analyze the arguments as such, and that requires much less attention to context. But um, right now, the major goal is not to uh, isolate some arguments, abstract them from the text. Uh, the major goal is to understand the text. I, I always recommend starting there. Start with the great books of philosophy. Okay, so what else happens in the text uh, after these arguments? Well, Philanus describes uh, the advantages of his view. So he's shown that God exists and that matter does not. Advantages of this, well, we prove the existence of God. The doctrine that there is life after death, that the soul continues to exist independently of the body, that the soul is itself immortal. This healthy doctrine is supported by immaterialism because the soul is proved to be immaterial and only matter is corruptible, meaning um, matter 
uh, can decay, and can break, can fall apart. Non-physical things don't do that. The God of the doctrine of immaterialism is also quite near and relevant to us, to human beings, which makes the doctrine even more beneficial to morality. So um, uh, God and immortality are two uh, really important principles that a lot of these early modern philosophers like uh, Leibniz and Berkeley and, and Kant are interested, and Descartes, are interested in uh, defending, or at least defending, uh, they're interested in defending belief in God and immortality of the soul. And they think this is healthy for a, a proper religion, and this is healthy for a proper morality. If the soul is immortal, God exists, and if God is um, always watching, like, um, like what's her name, Roslyn, on, um, on Monsters, Inc. Um, this teacup that I'm perceiving, and that you're perceiving the video of, it's now no longer, now no longer where I can see it. Does it still exist? Of course it does. But it doesn't exist in my mind right now because I'm not perceiving it. It exists in the mind of God, which means God is here. God is near. God is relevant. God is perceiving this teacup into existence even when I can't see it. And um, I should watch what I'm doing. God's, God's seeing everything I'm doing in this office. Uh, quite, the, quite the incentive to watch yourself, since God is always watching. And various problems in metaphysics and physics are solved, and the mind-body problem uh, evaporates. Uh, these are some views of Philanus um, commenting on his argument. Now, on the third dialogue, Philanus actually admits that matter is not so bad. Matter, if you define it in the way certain philosophers have defined it, is a bad idea. We need to ditch that idea of matter. But if you use the word matter so as to uh, not confuse ordinary people, when we say the vulgar, uh, we don't mean to demean people. We actually just mean ordinary people. This is a uh, um, slightly older English, closer to older Latin, where it just means common, common, common people. The vulgar are ordinary, normal people, people who, whose uh, views of the world have not been corrupted by silly philosophical theories. Use the word matter the way ordinary people do, and not the way the philosophers do. That's fine. What is a bad idea of matter that we need to say does not exist, there's no matter, is the philosophical doctrine of a material substratum, such as John Locke talked about. So uh, Locke believed in matter. Matter is the material substratum. It's that substance which underlies everything that has property. So my teacup has various property, size, color, shape, weight. And all of these are properties of the matter that underlies it. And this is a philosophical way of thinking about matter. And Berkeley thinks that it leads to all sorts of problems. What we should do is give up the idea that such matter exists. But the teacup exists. And if you want to say matter exists and think like an ordinary person, not a philosopher, be my guest, he says. Uh, that is to say, Philanus, who represents Barclay's position. Uh, I think it's very safe to say Philanus probably speaks for Barclay directly. If not, at any rate, he represents Barclay's position. Speaking for uh, and representing the position of are not necessarily the same thing. On this channel now, find, um, you know, if you're the right kind of nerd, uh, find the, the robots talking about truth. And um, uh, it's probably safe to say one of those robots represents my position, but, but I won't say that robot speaks for me. That's, that's uh, something a bit different. Anyway, I think Philanus represents Barclay's position and maybe can be said even to straightforwardly speak for Barclay. So, uh, Philanus and Barclay say, in effect, by all means, if you're thinking like an ordinary person, recognize the existence of matter. But um, what does that mean? It means don't think of matter as a material substratum. Stop thinking like a philosopher and just try to think like an ordinary person. What does an ordinary person think? She sees a teacup uh, and thinks there's matter here. I think she just thinks there's a thing that's existing independently of her mind. Good enough. That's, that's true. So now, uh, that's some contextual information on the arguments we can understand Barclay better. But, you know, as far as the argument goes, step back from the context and look at the argument. Analyze the argument. Now let's do that now. 
In fact, this will also involve some context. This premise, whatever we perceive, we perceive directly. That premise is also from Locke. So Barclay is taking one thing from Locke, this premise, and he's using it to undermine Locke's idea of a material substratum as matter. Well, there's an alternative. You know what you can do? You can ditch this premise. And then none of the other conclusions follow. Cut this one. Eh. Well, Barclay doesn't like this one either, but you know, we can totally cut that. Eh. With or without that premise. This one. Eh. And actually, uh, at least by this particular argument, you can cut that. Eh. Maybe, uh, maybe not dispute the conclusion, because what I have in mind here is Thomas Reed, who certainly believes in the existence of God. Let's um, let's stop eh, in all these arguments. Let's just uh, select this and emphasize one very uh, important thing in the history of philosophy that has been done is to take all these arguments from Berkeley, who begins with this particular premise from Locke, and to avoid the conclusions of Berkeley, like everything we perceive is in the mind and matter does not exist, all by just not accepting this premise. This is the approach of Thomas Reed, the common sense philosopher. And um, while I think Berkeley was trying to defend common sense, meaning roughly what ordinary people normally and properly think, uh, as opposed to silly ideas that have been suggested by or influenced by silly philosophers. Well, Berkeley is trying to do that. I think Reed does it a lot better. Reed is the great common sense philosopher. Whatever we perceive, we perceive directly, says Locke, leading to all these uh, Berkeley and conclusions. And Thomas Reed comes along and looks at the root and he says, this, this is wrong. Whatever we perceive, we perceive directly is not true. We actually perceive a lot indirectly. So this is one very important thing that has been done with the argument. Now, actually, I think the premises guarantee the conclusion. Um, if you're gonna say that not everything we perceive is in the mind or the matter does not exist, or um, uh, if you don't believe in God and you want to not follow this conclusion, and indeed, if you want to avoid a high list argument as well, you're gonna to have to disagree with some premise. Now, Philonis doesn't like Hylas' conclusion here. Uh, uh, which premise does he disagree with? Not that one, uh, this one. Uh, Philonis is going to disagree with this premise in order to avoid Hylas' conclusion in the second dialogue. And meanwhile, Thomas Reed will accept this conclusion, but he's not going to make the same kind of argument for the existence of God. And this is one thing you can do. Avoid certain conclusions, like that one, by avoiding this premise, and that is the approach of Thomas Reed. Now, word of advice. Um, this is uh, presumably a video in the Great Arguments in Philosophy playlist on my YouTube channel, Teacher of Philosophy. I have a long series of 22 videos investigating Thomas Reed. At the time, I am recording this video. It is May of 2021. The time this thing is airing, this uh, this particular video you're watching right now, it's probably, uh, I don't know, uh, August, September 2021 or something like that. The Thomas Reed videos, the 22 Thomas Reed videos, where I go over Reed's rejection of this premise in uh, extreme detail, those videos will not begin until sometime in 2022 on YouTube. If you want to get an early look, you can find them on my Rumble channel. Look up Teacher of Philosophy on Rumble. Email me if you have trouble finding the link. Okay, um, but it will all be on YouTube eventually. Okay, um, I think I'm done. Uh, thanks for watching.